another lecture reading. My name is Melinda Cole Klein. Post-war prosperity led to the development of a pervasive consumer culture, advertising creating an image of the ideal American middle-class family, surrounded by the trappings of material wealth. Television came to dominate the leisure hours of Americans, and its programming and commercials reinforced the values of middle-class consumerism. During the economic boom of the 1950s, middle-class parents were able to provide their teams with higher weekly allowances. In addition, scholars claim 40% more teens in 1954 worked after school jobs as compared with teens a decade earlier. This enabled young baby boomers more money to spend. This signaled a shift in the buying and purchasing habits of American teens. With the availability of personal record players, millions of vinyl records sold annually. While American Bandstand and Disney's Mickey Mouse Club produced wholesome musical formats for youths, rebellious youths preferred minority-inspired music that fueled conflict between parents and their children. My lecture is titled, Class Conformity and Resistance, 1955 to 1968. Historical categories that I have included in this lecture are as follows. The Beat Generation. Brown versus the Board of Education spawns a desegregated America. Rock and Roll Criticized. Economic Impact of 1950s Music, Television Shows and 1950s Music Trends, American Youthful Reception of Rock and Roll, New Occupations for African Americans in the Music and Recording Industries, along with the election of John F. Kennedy in 1960. The counterculture beat generation argued it was better not to conform to the rigid standards expected by parents, the government, and the economy. Its foreign influences were Asian, heavily, and non-Christian. This youth culture contested the status quo the expected middle-class model of conformity and sameness. These practices would create the hippie generation. This viable counterculture minority advocated extensive time and attention given to musical expression, freedom from sexual restraints, and reliance to rules and regulations of any kind that would limit personal experiences. This led to a youth popular movement, in particular marginal youths, out of control of the usual society markers. This would be parents and, when they failed, the police. This subculture stressed the use of drugs and sexual experiments, including multiple partners, no bonds between partners, and fathers produce children but lack traditional support to offspring, whether emotional or financial. Middle class cultural rebels existed in the music industry and in literature, powerful mediums to persuade young minds into living lives of freedom. Cultural rebels were many. They existed in print, such as J.D. Salinger's Catcher in the Rye from 1946, 
this contradiction of American lifestyle and values became known at the Beat Generation meetings. Beats were a model of rebellious behavior to youths by the 1960s. Another significant sign of a rebellious youth culture in the 1950s was due to the popularity of music heavily influenced with black jazz in rock and roll songs. Parents cringed as their seemingly innocent children flocked to hear a young Tennessee singer named Elvis Presley. With rock and roll songs, a sexy voice, gyrating hips, and other techniques borrowed from black singers, making him the king of rock and roll. Prior to the landmark case, Brown v. Board of Education, 1954, American school children attended these institutions based on their race, in particular kindergarten through 12th grade. With the desire by African Americans to teach black children in a setting void of white prejudice, segregated schools became standard. For white states with black populations, separating the races fit into customary and legal practices of separate but equal. With the federal decision in Plessy v. Ferguson of 1896. But by the 1940s, in the post-war years, so much had changed. And some argued for a desegregated America. In time, the restrictive 1940s gave way to the decade of the 1950s. This would bring in desegregation, at least legally, to the nation's public schools from 1954. With victory won, America began a long struggle that would offer advancement of American blacks. It would offer educational, occupational, and social doors for them, long denied under separate but equal customs and laws. This ruling would bring confidence back to African Americans, resulting in a higher number of voting blacks and those seeking college educations. It encouraged the movement of blacks from poor southern states that resisted the pluralistic policies forced on them by Washington, D.C. So with the movement of over 3 million African Americans out of the South between the 1940s and 1950s, their cultural traditions found their way into Middle America. And from this, rock and roll would emerge. As the 1940s came to an end, American prosperity continued to increase. Some scholars claim that American national wealth between 1947 and the early 1960s rose by 60%. Thus, American middle-class families had more money to spend on entertainment and leisure activities than in the past. This combined with suburban sprawl and a youthful baby boom population and the migration of African Americans out of southern states fueled new entertainment forms. By the 1940s, African American music infused new elements into popular music to which R&B, rhythm and blues, would be played on records and on the radio. But in a segregated America, Black-inspired music was often banned in nightclubs or by radio stations. One of the reasons why Elvis was acceptable to radio and producers was that he was white. And American critics of rock and roll printed their rejection of this music 
based on a variety of factors. First, as compared with music of the past, it was considered base and ill-conceived. Secondly, its lyrics were often criticized as sexually implicit, as words carried double meanings. All the while, this emerging music genre appealed to youths rejecting traditions of American life, such as work, parental authority, and illicit sex. As churches, schools, parents, and cities established limits in attempting to control its corrupting influences, its popularity spread. Popular singing stars at the time, such as Frank Sinatra and Nat King Cole, either condemned rock and roll or avoided it altogether. Teenagers came to Presley concerts in unprecedented numbers. Middle-class school boards, parents, and the government considered music inspired by black rhythm and blues sounds highly suggestive and tried to ban it. But white, middle-class American children looking for a new sound led to the popularity of rockabilly stars such as Elvis Presley and others. Later in Detroit, by the 1960s, the success of Motown Records contributed to new sounds including The Supremes, The Four Tops, Marvin Gaye, and Stevie Wonder, while rock and roll continued to evolve. Additionally, the influence of New Orleans-style blues by artists of the South shaped the direction of R&B throughout the 1940s and the 1950s, to which Atlantic Records, this is out of New York City, left an indelible mark on music history in its time. By the 1960s, Atlantic Records signed soul artists as they became popular as a music genre all on their own. After her stint with Columbia Records, Aretha Franklin signed with Atlantic. In the last 10 years, movie producers have remembered the histories in a few memorable films. One in particular, for me as a historian, I have to say stands out from the crowd. This is Cadillac Records, produced in 2008 by TriStar Films. It offers background and personal biographies of Chess Records, a Chicago-based R&B, early rock, along with some jazz during its early days. Theater entertainments from drama to tragedies and romantic comedies became an art form from the time of the plays by William Shakespeare. Musical productions found popularity on stage and film as an outgrowth of the opera. Once television became more popular and affordable, by the 1950s musical shows competed and lasted the Beatles from England were the first seen as a band in 1963 on the Ed Sullivan Show, which began running as a Sunday night program in 1948. Ed Sullivan was in many ways progressive. He did not shy away from featuring unknown artists or black entertainers. While the Beatles became an instant hit in America, other new rock and roll groups from the UK included the Rolling Stones, The Doors, and then here in America, Aretha Franklin, Elvis Presley by 1956, among others. The gyrating hips of Elvis brought much debate over what he could do in front of the camera for millions of Americans to view. To resolve this problem, Elvis was filmed from the waist up. Artists who knew 
this popular music and the audiences returned for additional appearances. Disney's Mickey Mouse Club enjoyed a run from 1955 to 1996, but attracted a preteen crowd along similar clean-cut lines as would Dick Clark on American Bandstand. American Bandstand hosted by this individual who recently passed away featured live acts as well. This was a long-running program from the early years of the 1950s to 1987 when it went off the air. While the Ed Sullivan Show ended in 1971, Clark was able to navigate the changing music scene of the 1970s with the popularity of disco and beyond. Clark promoted in the 1950s the clean-cut American youth. Teenagers who appeared on this show stood in stark contrast to the rebellious undercurrent popularized by rock and roll artists and such films as James Dean's portrayal in Rebel Without a Cause that came out in 1955. American Bandstand projected a wholesome image with talents such as Pat Boone, Frankie Avalon, Bobby Darin, Fabian, and Frank Sinatra. In the 1950s, this program shown in the afternoon, fans watched and copied the latest fashions and hairstyles. The rolled down socks popular in Catholic schools and their uniform dress apparently became a national fad because of this show. For girls, sporting them were called Bobby Soxers. However, rock and roll, whether seen live or on television, was performed by men and boys. American females were in the audience, or perhaps they were dancers. They were typically the subjects of songs, but they were not the singers. Across the decades, there has been considerable prejudice about female guitar players once they did arrive on the scene, such as the pioneering success of Joni Mitchell from the 1960s. While male guitar players in rock and roll bands were macho and desirable, the rightful place during the 1950s for women was as spectators or groupies. In this world for a time, rock and roll was played by male talent. While female R&B, pop, and country singers rose to considerable fame, it would be years before we would see girl rock and roll bands with top 10 hits. While early rock and roll crowds were attended by both boys and girls, it seems the boys wanted to sing like Mick Jagger of the Rolling Stones or play the drums like Ringo Starr of the Beatles. And girls became overly emotional as musicians mesmerize them. Welcome back. While you might not be aware, I should mention that before the 20th century, the concept of pre-adulthood was not seen in the same way that it is now. The teenager is a modern construct. Adolescence and juvenile delinquents were teen markers that were added to the American language and dictionaries late in the 19th century. Historically, those between the ages of 13 and what we consider young adults. Smaller inside, but adults nonetheless. This idea shifted during the industrial period. From that day until the present, 
we consider adolescence as a particular time in the aging process. Once it passes, this time will not return because the adult is fully grown and mature. The term teenager would be a new word in our language after World War II. And it would be this segment of society that songwriters and producers of rock and roll would specifically market their talent and technology that would allow these youths with money to spend to buy records, attend concerts, and listen to songs in the privacy of their own rooms with the modern record player. To bring rock and roll mainstream, the lyrics had to be toned down. And to do this, rock and roll promoters had to acquire a reputation in which they would separate themselves from the juvenile delinquents. In doing so, this would smooth the generational anxiety that drove a wedge between parents and their children. Soft rock and romantic tunes sung by Elvis helped to bridge the gap. American Bandstand helped as well to foster parents to take a second look at rock and roll music without the horrors of early rock. Rock and roll, along with R&B, opened economic doors for African Americans. As independent record companies, they had control over the kinds of music they decided to develop and the type of artists with whom to work. Independent record companies hired black men and women to work in a variety of positions from secretaries to sound men, music mixers, and backup singers or instrument players. As background players, the Funk Brothers were notable. From Detroit, the best of the best were gathered in 1959 by Motown Records to become the sound behind the talent. Thus, it would be the independent labels that offered new occupations to African Americans from the late 1940s, not the major record companies. In time, radio announcers appealed to teen listeners with do's and don'ts regarding drinking and the practice of good behavior. But besides all this rock and roll, if it could be mainstream music, it had the potential to make millions of dollars for record companies if one of their artists hit it big. While independents were only minor players in the record industry in the early 1950s, they would claim the lion's share of profits from top singles sold by 1957. Major record companies such as RCA considered rock and roll to be a fad. However, the production of inexpensive singles purchased by American youths continued well into the 1960s. Radio stations were licensed for the most part by the Broadcast Music Corporation. If a station played music BMI found inappropriate, the stations could lose their license. In addition, a station survived because of the amount of advertising it received. If advertising companies pulled their ads because the radio station played race music, they would go out of business overnight. So playing what was considered by many to be inferior music put radio stations in a precarious financial situation. While BMI tried desperately to retain control of the entertainment industry, the fact was rock and roll was profitable. And by the time Elvis Presley hit the airwaves, BMI could do little to stop this music outside of the government and laws banning it. 
A radio station could make or break an artist. Competition was steep, and getting on the air likely involved aggressive marketing, such as visiting dozens of radio stations in person. This brings us to the practice of offering gifts or monetary incentives by agents, record companies, or the artist to play a particular record. Radio station disc jockeys held considerable power, but they were often poorly paid, thus easily corruptible. To save themselves from losing their licenses, radio stations fired hundreds of DJs as the Federal Communications Commission was cracking down on the practices of accepting bribes. Record companies suffered when their stars landed in jail or were otherwise occupied. Chuck Berry of Chess Records was at the top of his fame when he was arrested and later convicted for transporting an underage girl across state lines. In his second trial of 1962, this event landed him in jail for three years. By this time, Elvis Presley had moved on to pop, bringing him into the musical mainstream. However, similar to Chuck Berry, he took a hiatus from music and the industry by enlisting in the U.S. Army. As encouraged by his manager, the strategy worked, and Elvis symbolized youthful patriotism. By the 1950s, dialogues opened between the Soviet President Khrushchev and Vice President Richard Nixon regarding trade and commerce. In this age, the late 1950s were immortalized with the image of the grandfatherly type portrayed by President Eisenhower, but the election of 1960 would shift this power. Richard Nixon was born to California working-class parents who ran a grocery store in Whittier. Nixon would start at the private four-year university at Whittier College. With his BA, Nixon attended Duke University Law School before entering politics. And he possessed political experience early on, as many lawyers tend to do. He got politically his feet wet with the Alger Hess case and became senator in 1950 and vice president under Eisenhower. It seemed Richard Nixon was best suited and prepared as the next president in the election cycle of 1960. But his time had not yet come. As the Democratic contender, John F. Kennedy took a different road to power. Born to wealth and prestige in Boston, Massachusetts, Kennedy attended private schools, then went to college at Harvard. He served in World War II in the Pacific, and then in the post-war years, he was elected to Congress in 1946 and 1952. Kennedy, unlike Nixon, was Roman Catholic. He was of Irish descent, less experienced than Nixon. Until the election of JFK, the office of the president had not been filled by a Catholic American. But JFK looked good on television, and he was a good speaker. This appealed to millions of voters. The historic national debate was televised to millions of viewers. More than 80 million Americans watched the debates or listened to them on the radio. Like it is today, television is a powerful political medium. The handsome, confident, well-dressed Kennedy won over American hearts in contrast to Nixon's awkwardness and stuffy appearance. While Nixon had the experience, 
this race for the presidency was influenced in part by the words and charming personality of JFK, the youngest president ever to be elected to this office. Kennedy was age 43, winning the election of 1960. This started a new era in the history of America. And this presidency would see considerable challenges. After taking office in 1961, the civil rights movement heated up. And then there would be the Bay of Pigs debacle, while Eastern Germany under Russian control would build the Berlin Wall, dividing the East from the West. Sadly, this popular president was assassinated on November 22, 1963. Still today, much controversy surrounds this assassination, as some consider it the result of a conspiracy targeting the president. Well, this concludes my lecture reading. I would like to thank you uh, for your time. I hope to see you again. Mm -hmm.